So I'd like to hand over to Professor Chris Ashford, who is Chair of the Association of Law Teachers, to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Nigel. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see so many people here tonight. Um, and so you've got some fresh faces as well, which is quite nice, and some people who haven't been to Up John's for recent years. You've got a whole range of literature in front of you, which I know you're going to be so gripped by Becky's talk, you're not going to read until the end. Um, but you'll see a series of handouts there that uh, show you all the past Up John lectures and some of our fabulous speakers um, that we've had over the years. You'll also see a little postcard um, that you can take away with you and treasure, ping on your fridges. Um, that is highlighting next year's annual conference, 2016, and we're up in the magnificent city of Newcastle. And you can see there where we'll be having some of our social events at the Baltic and um, at the Sage uh, in Gateshead. Uh, it's going to be at Northumbria Law School, and the call for papers is live. On the back of the card you can see the web link, so please do get putting your proposals in. Uh, you'll also see in your packs uh, that we have Next year's lecture, already organised with Dame Linda Dobbs. I hope you'll be circling your diaries for November, and we'll be giving you the exact dates a little bit later on next year. Also, there's a shameless plug for a book, um, of, um, which is rather expensive, as some of you will have noticed. Uh, one for your libraries, I think. Uh, on Perspectives on Legal Education. And this is a collection from, uh, edited by myself, Nigel and Jess, uh, who are all here. Um, so you'll have to wait a bit longer for signed copies, I'm afraid. Uh, and this pulls together a whole series of past Up John lectures, as well as some modern reflections on issues in legal ed education, including our speaker tonight. So that's surely reason enough to put that on your Christmas wish list. On the sceptical faces, sceptical faces, <laughs> this, this is surprising me, I don't know why. Um, and if any of you are not members of the ALT, which I find hard to believe, but if any of you are not, which is, have a word with yourselves, because that's disgraceful, uh, then there are application forms here as well, so no excuses whatsoever to fill in and join us uh, and be part of this fantastic organisation. For those of you who tweet, you'll see that we've got a hashtag for the evening. Um, those of you who don't tweet, I'm not enough drugs. Uh, this is the UpJohn15, so UpJohn15 is the hashtag for the evening, so... And if you are on your phones, we'll assume you're tweeting and not giving up and messaging home for help. Uh, if you want to get retweets, then uh, please do use the ALT Law. And then Zoe, who will be shamelessly photographing and tweeting like mad throughout this session, our paparazzi in the crowd, uh, will be retweeting as well. So if you want to boost your followers, sounds all messianic. Over a thousand, so please do tweet the ALT and share it. Share our fantastic news with you. Um, it brings me to our speaker tonight, and our speaker is known to many of you, and you've got a biography in front of you which doesn't in any way do this person credit. Um, she's a phenomenal character, a star, uh, quite literally this evening, a bright star, <laughs> blindingly so, some might say, uh, a star of the legal education movement, someone who has made a major impact when it comes to thinking about quality in legal education and thinking about benchmarking. And more recently, Becky's work has really informed uh, what the Bar Standards Board in particular have been doing. As chair of the QA8, it's fair to say she had a bit of a say on that document, uh, which is going to influence legal education across this country. Uh, she is um, an amazing character, an amazing part of the legal education community, and she's going to be talking to us tonight about tripping over thresholds, capturing the legal education process and outcomes. Over to you, my darling. Thank you. I've already changed my mind on where I want to stand. Some people. Um, I am delighted, thrilled, and very honoured to have been invited to deliver the annual Lord Up John Lecture. I've been attending these lectures for a number of years, and I helped arrange the last two. And I think you all know the esteem in which I hold the Association of Law Teachers. And I praise unreservedly and unconditionally all the committee does to contribute to and steer the direction of legal education across the UK and internationally. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts about legal education with you. So now, 
If you're able to, please would you stand up? <laughs> she was expecting that. <laughs> you all ready? Please remain standing if you think like a lawyer. If not, please take a seat. Some were thinking and hovering. Remain standing. For those of you still standing, and please understand for the purposes of a lecture, this is rhetorical, which one? I don't have time to explore your thinking now. And I know this phrase is loved and loathed in equal measure by many, many colleagues. But when you think like a lawyer, which lawyer is it? Is it a solicitor? Is it a barrister? Is it a judge? If it's a judge, is it Lord Denning? Is it Lord Sumption? <laughs> Lady Hale? Is it an academic? Is it your law teacher? Do you even have a role model? Or when you think like a lawyer, are you thinking in a lawyerly way and therefore that is a lawyer? Please have a seat. Thank you for playing along. This lecture tries to explore legal education in part by investigating the phrase thinking like a lawyer, which until I finished this lecture in my preparation, I loathed. I'm going to explore the, it in the context of threshold concepts. So I'm going to be exploring ontological questions. That's the best slide I could find on ontology. And that is causing us to consider our view of reality and epistemological issues, which will involve how we acquire knowledge and what knowledge is, albeit in the context of legal knowledge, skills, behaviours, attributes. I address this point, however, to those who remained seating, or sat down. I apologise, I don't at this stage have time to ask you why you sat nor why some of you hovered and then sat. But it may be because it is your ontological view that you do not think you think like a lawyer. Or it may be your epistemological view that it's not something that can be known or learnt. And both of these views are as worthy of investigation as thinking like a lawyer for those of you who remain standing. What I'm going to talk about is threshold concepts. Forgive me if you already know this, those of you who perhaps don't. A threshold concept is a learning experience. It is a thought process or process processes which resemble passing through a portal from which a new perspective opens up, allowing things not formally seen to come into view. It is a transformation in our understanding. It reformulates our frame of meaning in our discipline. But the journey across that portal, as beautiful as that looks, isn't necessarily easy and it isn't always comfortable. Because threshold concepts are transformative, they're often irreversible, but they're troublesome. And some have described them less as a portal and more as a hurdle and sometimes a barrier and sometimes a brick wall. But crossing the threshold changes the way you think and act. They came from here. The authors, Jan Mayer, Rayland and Caroline Bailey, who came on later, were trying to understand why and when students get stuck. And their investigation became so much more. They're looking at transformation and portals. And threshold concepts are exciting because they do facilitate a transformation in the learner. I can vouch for this. I felt that I've gone through a threshold concept to understand, educationally speaking, threshold concepts. There is an epistemological change because they capture 
the cognitive and affective parts of our brain. You know the difference between what you know and how you feel about it. And the frustration sometimes. And they're, ontologically speaking, they're transformative as well. Because they can change how we see ourselves, our identity, our reality. And they can give us that epiphany, that light bulb moment. They can provide us with a new world view. Don't take my word for it. Hi, Becky. This is John Flood. I'm trying to figure out what my light bulb moment was, and I think it came when I was traveling on a train across the Sahara Desert some years ago between the bottom of Egypt and Khartoum in Sudan. And the train got increasingly full, and the fuller it got, people started sitting on the roof. And it was illegal to travel on the roof, but the way you did it was to tie yourself by a rope to the pipe in the middle of the roof and just sit there and hope you don't fall off. The ticket inspector came down and he punched all the tickets anyway, so people seemed to think it was all right. Until at one point a guy fell off and when he did, the train had to stop and the guards came from the van at the end of the train and they arrested him. I asked somebody why and they said, oh, well, because he, he was illegally traveling on the roof. And while this was going on, everybody was screaming at him and shouting and yelling for holding up the train and having fallen off the roof and he was taken away. And I sat there thinking, well, what on earth is going on here? How does this make sense? But I suppose what it made me realize is just how subtle, open, nuanced the interpretation of law is. That it's not just a simple binary operation, black, white, yes, no, right, wrong, legal or illegal. It has many flavors, interpretations, many facets which are in a way embodied in us so i think that's what it did it for me with thanks to john flood so much for that so john's moment was the realization that law is nuanced subtle not binary and this is dreadfully troublesome for those of us employed to teach students because it means the law and learning the law not necessarily what students expect. The multifaceted nature of law means the novice student seeks the right answer and can't always find a simple yes or no, right or wrong. And pretty much universally across the literature in threshold concepts, so across disciplines, across jurisdictions, across levels, handling uncertainty is one of the most commonly identified threshold concepts. And the literature explains just how troublesome that is to learn. And they're troublesome because, although they often build on core concepts that learners can know and understand, learners don't connect those core concepts until they cross the threshold. That's the nature of the threshold concept because it's described as being integration of those basic concepts and passing the threshold brings them together. It means they often need to know quite a lot of law before they can see the bigger picture. And that's why that is another reason why it's so troublesome. It's also described as liminal. A liminal relates to transitions, but in it, anthropology, Liminality captures the quality of ambiguity and disorientation that occurs in the middle stages of a ritual or rite of passage. And that's why the between <laughs> catching on. So student learners can be preliminal. Liminal is not a comfortable place to be. And postliminal. But John Flood's post-liminal epiphany wasn't comfortable. It's not like you get there and go, woohoo, I'm safe. Because his rite of passage was to recognize how nuanced and subtle and complex the interpretation of law was and is. And that isn't a comfortable thought. But I wonder whether we can say that's what a lawyer does. It's thinking like a lawyer, being prepared to be unsure 
or in doubt. And if we talk about uncertainty and, un uh, excuse me, uncertainty and complexity in law, here is Richard Moorhead talking about when he realised the bigger picture. What was my legal learning epiphany? Well, it was in a clinical legal education class at Warwick University, legal practice, and they had us dealing with real clients, and I was advising a client on a small claims hearing, and we were due to go and represent them a week or two later, and we were going through their case, and I think it was at that point that I really started to grapple with the uncertainty of law, how uncertain some of the basic concepts uh, were, what it might mean really is to deal with something like reasonableness, uh, say, and it was at that point that I think that I understood some of the power and responsibility that was engaged by being a lawyer, and that was for me the moment that my legal education really like lit up. That, that power and responsibility in the context of uncertainty, and it's that uncertainty that I'm going to explore now. Many authors have identified uncertainty across disciplines as a threshold uh, concept in law. And in law, the concept of the, con sorry, the contingent nature of law. Aidan Ricketts, who writes in this area, suggests that thinking like a lawyer is a threshold concept itself. Not just because it is uncertain, the law is uncertain, but he suggests it's because the law involves a counterintuitive form of discourse. And he illustrates this by way of several examples, one of which is that a corporation is, in law, a person. And he says that's counterintuitive. I would say this is part of the nature of law, but I'm exploring thinking like a lawyer, and I'm not sure being able to grasp the counterintuitive nature of law is necessarily part of being a lawyer. I'm open-minded to it. And the reason I say that, though, is there, is there are elements of cognitive dissonance throughout the world, the commercial and professional world. This isn't unique to law or lawyers. Nick James, Australian writing in this area, agrees. Thinking like a lawyer is a threshold concept. He warns about adopting a narrow definition of the phrase, limiting it to, for example, engaging in formal legal reasoning, recognizing legal issues, locating relevant legal rules, applying the rules of law to the fact of the problem, and reaching an evidenced and rational conclusion. He wishes it to be expanded, I think because he teaches ethics, to include an, an appreciation of ethical practice and social justice and identifying and working with policies underlying legal rules, and then he goes further, taking advantage of the fundamental indeterminacy of the law. And it's this fundamental indeterminacy that we see as a theme through some of the writing. Judith Wegner, who some of you will know is a co-author on the Carnegie Report in the United States, looking at stages of apprenticeship and becoming a lawyer, spent a long time looking at the phrase, thinking like a lawyer. And she, she thinks the phrase is important. But she thinks that the phrase may be part of the problem. She calls it a wicked problem. And a naming problem, which is why Rumpelstiltskin appears on the slide. Because the phrase fails to acknowledge the complexities of the issues involved in law and legal learning. She says there are multiple dimensions that are interrelated, easy solutions that are not readily available, and resolution or attaining competence is rarely a linear process, but rather one that involves a good deal of trial and error in working with solutions, not just the problem itself. She asserts the phrase thinking like a lawyer deserves to be unpacked, deconstructed, and I'm doing her a disservice here by summarizing that she thinks that t thinking like a lawyer, in fact, involves three elements. The process of reasoning, which is a form of reasoning situated in the legal context. 
the nature of law and the changing nature of society within that and the role of lawyers with their power, responsibility and roles. She does, of course, include the uncertainty of law within her examination of thinking like a lawyer. And she says that legal educators are well aware that the challenge of grappling with uncertainty at times paralyzes law students. It's part of the liminality. But she says that dealing with uncertainty is not unique to law, and she must be right. My reading suggests that professionals in all disciplines are required to deal with uncertainty. And it may be, it may be the hallmark of the expert that they are able confidently and competently to identify, deal with, and manage uncertainty in their field. In her research, it was suggested to Wegner that critical thinking was the threshold concept in law. And she asserts it may be one, but it's not the only one, because whatever we may think of ourselves, we're not the only people who think critically. And perhaps this is or should be obvious. Given that every year I taught on the, taught on the jurisprudence module in the final year at Nottingham Trent University, and we started, I always started with, how are you doing? Are you enjoying your law degree? You're in your third year of your law degree now. Well done. So, let's start with something easy, shall we? What's law? And you'd feel by your third year, you'd know. And the confusion, the horror, uh, just a brief discussion for the first few minutes allowed students to realise there is no universally agreed definition of law. And if we can't find a universally agreed definition of law, how are we going to find a universally agreed definition of what a lawyer does or thinks? Wegner, leaning, I think, quite strongly on Dewey, says that it is the uncertainty of and in the, the nature of law that leads to the best thinking about law. There's further research done by someone called, I think his name is pronounced Erkelind, in Australia. And he investigated thinking like a lawyer with law students. And they went through several different ideas, but settled on legal reasoning as the threshold concept. So when I first saw legal reasoning, I thought of IRAC. It's how I was taught law, or how to structure an answer. And it's not easy, but it's quite simple. You identify the issue, and there's some complex processes involved in identifying the issue. Researching the rules, the complexity therein, applying the rules, and reaching a conclusion. But I think that skips over the processes if we're to, de if we're to deconstruct thinking like a lawyer. Because learning about law and using authorities well, learning about the authoritative nature of those authorities, and handling the uncertainty and ambiguity in law isn't captured in IRAC. And Eklund's research didn't adopt the IRAC method. They said they found, thought that legal reasoning provides students with a sense of self-identity as a lawyer. They pass through the portal of knowing what it means to be a lawyer. Once inducted into legal reasoning, a student is able to look at the other side and accept there is no right answer. They know they have to think deeply about meaning and argument and be persuasive, problematize and question issues, test the facts and the boundaries and the limits of the issues. And picking up on this idea of the identity of the lawyer and the student reading law, inculcate students into the integrated nature of the culture of legal argument. Taking responsibility for your position contradicts the possibility of simply making an assertion without backing it up. And that's why I've never lost an argument, because I will invent the authority if it doesn't exist. 
and make sure I'm arguing with someone who doesn't know. Or I'll move the goalposts. Thinking like a lawyer or legal reasoning, the threshold concept forces students to reconsider or possibly change their preconceptions of what law is. That's from a student. Saying it changed my preconception of what the law is and what it can achieve. I summarise some, some other research by um, Melissa Weresh. She echoes much of the research done elsewhere, but she argues the threshold concept in law is law's malleability. She defines that as an understanding of the latitude or flexibility a lawyer has in articulating the legal principles. I don't know what you think, but I think when a person defines law's malleability by reference to the lawyer, it speaks to me of legal realism. And I think I, I could have quoted Oliver Wendell Holmes here or Jerome Frank or, or Carl Llewellyn at this stage. So let's look in more detail at legal learning. This brings me not before time to my role on the Law Subject Benchmark Panel in 2014 to 15. I was invited to chair the working group looking at the 2014 iteration of the Law Subject Benchmark, which had first been uh, designed in 1999, published in 2000, again in 2007. And I said yes, and then had to find out what a benchmark statement was. And each of the benchmark statements across higher education across the UK defines what can be expected of a graduate in that subject in terms of what they might know, do, and understand at the end of their studies. So what we often said in the panel is I want you to think of the student walking across on graduation day, the student graduating with law, LLB, BA Law. What makes them different from all other graduates on the day? Because law is not general studies. Before I look into the answers that we came up with, I want you to know I do know the controversy surrounding subject benchmark statements. When they were first mooted in the late 1990s, this idea there'd be a syllabus. And also, there, is, there continues to be very strong arguments against outcome based education. I'm not calling for the subject benchmark statements all to be redesigned in terms of the journey and threshold concept. That's not their role. But I do think that what we did on the working group was trying to look at what makes a law graduate different from the other graduates and we borrowed a lot of the ideas from threshold concepts in formulating that. I assembled, I think it was the biggest group for the subject benchmark statement in law. And it's academics, legal regulators and practitioners. And I would like to take this opportunity formally to thank for their help, their guidance, their wisdom, their challenges, the disagreements along the way. When we first met, I, I asked the group, the first task, developing conversations that we've been having as part of the subject association meetings after the legal education training review, the graduateness of law. We wanted to capture the essence of law as an undergraduate discipline and articulate what makes the law graduate different from the others. And I had a bit of a problem because it's phrased in terms of outcomes. And everything we were thinking was describing the journey to graduateness, which I think is now used so broadly across the sector, we can say it is a real word. And I wondered whether I could do this, whether I could chair, because all of my previous research had been about the legal learning journey, the process, certainly one that for me has never stopped. And now I was being asked to focus on the target, the goal, the outcome, that final assessment that shows competence. And could I still focus on crossing the portal or the journey? And did it have to be either or? Well, we think 
we did merge threshold concepts with threshold outcomes. And we started by borrowing from the history subject benchmark statement. Instead of listing knowledge and skills, we described the subject benchmark outcomes as the skills and qualities of mind. As a subtle distinction to describe the qualities of thinking. Not like a lawyer, but as an undergraduate crossing over that stage and at the other end being a graduate of law. So we included intellectual independence, including asking and answering cogent questions about law and legal systems. And it's the process of asking and answering the questions about law, about the law, that distinguishes the law student, the law graduate. And we added, and this was the first time it had appeared, and in a law subject benchmark, but doesn't appear across many other subject benchmark statements, even in the non-law non disciplines, the ability to recognize ambiguity and deal with uncertainty in law. But you don't see references to ambiguity and uncertainty across many of the subject benchmark statements, notwithstanding disciplinary research that the threshold concept in that area is dealing with uncertainty. It is in the history one described as an inherent problem in the historical record that there's ambiguous, conflicting or incomplete data, but it doesn't appear very broadly. And what I think we did there is we took a threshold concept in law and stated it as an outcome for undergraduate legal education. For me, that was probably the most significant thing that we, we did on that panel. And certainly in the responses to it, nobody raised an issue about it, its existence. But what I had done is I'd used the word tolerate in the first draft. The ability to tolerate ambiguity and uncertainty. I was thinking of tolerating in the Isaiah Berlin way, that this is an active thing you have to do if you want to tolerate something and you don't necessarily agree with it. And I, I'm grateful to people who responded to it. Recognising and dealing with is rather better. Further, we added... Well, this was already there. The 2007-2000 version had principles and the values of law. We added and justice, principles and values of law and justice, and of ethics. That was one of the leading recommendations of the Legal Education Training Review. And ethics is in the law subject benchmark, much to 100% of respondents to the law subject benchmark consultations agreement. We also had... Theory, um, sorry, awareness, no, we didn't, knowledge and understanding of the theories, concepts, values, principles and rules of public and private laws in an institutional, social, national and global context and the ability to produce a synthesis of the doctrinal and policy issues, presenting a reasoned choice between the alternative solutions, including critical judgments the merits of a case. And it's this latter point that I wish to illustrate with our next guest speaker who is in the audience today. This idea of asking questions and getting a synthesis, a pulling together of things that were disparate and untidy and troublesome and difficult. And then the final realisation that it didn't have to be that hard. Oh, please. It sounds simplistic, but things all came together for me through a legal skills class, probably why I'm so obsessed with skills teaching now. Gaining a structure with which to tackle a problem, identifying questions I should be asking myself, and understanding what the market actually wants changed the way I approached the subject altogether. The fog I had felt initially when faced with a problem started to dissipate more quickly. I was more attuned to what I'd actually had to take away from the reading of a chapter in a textbook or a journal article. My note-taking strategy changed. I crept away from my safety blanket of copying everything down and began to become more critical because I knew the purpose for the notes. Everything became that much easier to understand. 
It's a simple thing, not a glamorous recollection of something earth-shattering that made me want to become a lawyer in a traditional sense, but it just changed my life, and it's strange to look back now and see how fundamental that was to me then, and where it has unexpectedly led me now, being a lecturer, teaching modules, including legal method, to law students. Thank you. And what Emily, her post-liminal reflection, perhaps what she described as simple, might be simple, but it wasn't easy. And nor are, I suggest, the outcomes in the law subject benchmark statement, because learning the law isn't. Now, personally, I have never seen threshold concepts grasped better, portals crossed, transformations achieved, thinking like a lawyer better than in a moot sometimes during the moot, when the students finally realise the connections they're making on their hind legs, when they suggest, for example, a judge should distinguish what might otherwise be seen as a binding authority. And those of you who judge moots know that one of the most difficult questions, the first difficult question is, what is the ratio decidendi of that case? And second, am I bound by that authority? And when the student realises you're not and makes those connections, the epiphany is before your eyes. Because not all students have that epiphany. And they don't all have it during moots. And of course, some students mimic. And this is in the threshold literature. A student who goes through the steps that they think, mimicking what they think, lawyers do and how lawyers behave and still passing. I can't stop that. This is something that some people survive their whole lives by doing, is mimicking the grown-up that they think they should be. Mimicking in my position, the professor that you think you should be. You can't prevent mimicry. Outcomes-based education can't prevent mimicry. So I just want to put that out there. This isn't a solution to that. But what I am asking us to do is be aware of liminality in law. Be aware of the threshold concepts. And be aware of where students sometimes need a nudge or sometimes need a hand to cross the liminal space so we can be there to help. Bearing in mind, not all of us learnt at the same pace, and not all of our students do. And not all epiphanies are obvious or instantaneous. Hello, um, I'm Chris Ashford, and I've been struggling with this question of the light bulb moment. Um, and I guess some people do have that moment, that moment when a um, uh, a switch is flicked and, and, and when there's the flash above their heads and that kind of eureka moment. I guess if, if I was a light switch I'd be a dimmer switch um, <laughs> rather than one single moment. It's been, um, you could say I've been slowly getting turned on but that's, that sounds a bit wrong. Um, but it, it's been a series of moments rather, rather than one moment. I... Sorry, that's my bad editing. Chris continues. And so I kind of went through these stages of law being something artificial, law then evolving into a bit of a game, something to play, something that was fun, seeing law then as something that can impact on people's lives. And then it became really personal. It became something that was impacting on my life, that was shaping my life. And also something that could be shaped, something that isn't fixed, something that's contestable, something that... Um, we see all the time being contested, but we maybe don't think of it like that. Um, and, and that approach to law, that approach of law, thinking about it in context, thinking about what it means for real people, that's still something that drives me today. It's something that informs my teaching. It's something that uh, informs my research. But I don't think I've yet had that complete light bulb moment. I think I'm still having those moments. I don't think it ever stops. And I think that's the power of law. I guess if, if there is a, a kind of way of thinking about law, it's recognising that it, it's a journey that just keeps going, that you're con continuing to argue about law, you're continuing to debate law. 
I think that's what makes it so vibrant and so exciting. A journey in and about law that's vibrant and exciting. So is thinking like a lawyer a journey? Or is it something that can be achieved? Or is it something transformational or irreversible? So is it about thinking like a lawyer? Let me explain why it isn't. Because on its own, there ain't no such thing. Or rather. We should avoid using this phrase, please, unless we are prepared to unpack it and dissect it and consider the ingredients and the knowledge and the behaviours and the skills associated with it. Because there is no doubt there are ways of developing thoughts and behaviours about law. So what was my light bulb moment? I didn't have one. I was in a liminal state for a very long time. I call it my undergraduate experience. I'll give you an example. My final year, looking at the roles and responsibilities of directors of companies. And it only made sense when I'd finished the whole of the company law syllabus. And I could see the bigger picture. But it was never an epiphany. But I kept going, which is testament to the quality of the teacher I had, who could see the pain I was in, in every lecture. No, it's gone. Her encouragement that it would make sense eventually. She was right. Some of it made sense eventually. I understood minority shareholders' things. Can't tell you them now. But I understood the importance of a minority shareholder before the exam. She told me it would become coherent. And for that short period of time, it did. But it was no light bulb. I didn't have one as an undergraduate. In fact, it was much later. This is me and my best friend at Take That. She's Sarah. I've known her since I was six. She's a midwife. She's awesome in every way. Not just because she's a midwife, but she's awesome for that as well. And she works in a hospital. Midwives generally do. And she received a letter from her employer changing her contractual terms, changing her working hours and her shift pattern. She read the letter. She handed it over to her husband, Bruce, who read the letter, put it on the kitchen table and said, no more about it, until I popped round for a cup of tea. And they said, Bex, there's a letter on the table. Would you do that thing you do? And those were the words they used, do that thing you do. I didn't reflect on that until much, much, much later. So I read the letter and I said, it's a unilateral change in contractual terms, darling. So what's that mean? I said, they're changing your contract. I can't do that. They can't. It's right. What can I do? Accept it or leave? Shit. Yes. We went through all the different options that she had. But ultimately, she shifted her, she changed her shift pattern. And then on the drive home, I thought, what's that? do that thing you do. What did she mean? I had to absorb quite a lot of complex data in an area about which I knew very little. It was an NHS working pattern. I had to ask her a series of questions, what do you do now, what change would it mean for you? So consider various approaches to her problem, seeking furthers and betters along the way. Consider the different options and advise her on those options in a way she understood. And then I realised she paid me a tremendous compliment. And you might not think it's needed, but it built my confidence. I'm not professionally legally qualified. And after a little bit, I realised, yay me, I just did a thing in, in law. And I car carried that into the classroom. I've told my students this story, doing things with law. And Reflecting on my own preparation for this lecture, it made me realise the importance of understanding why we each need to think of our own learning, journey, and our students, their skills, their attitudes, and remembering that learning the law is personal. 
And that's why threshold concepts should inform our teaching, but not dictate it. And of course, we need to teach each student and facilitate each student's journey so they can find their way of thinking about law and not worry too much if we didn't have that epiphany when we cross the threshold. The next slide is a confession from a simply excellent teacher and a real game changer in legal education and research in legal education who feels I never had that moment of epiphany, I'm afraid, finding much of my law degree alien, bemusing and worrying, spending most of the three years feeling like a bit of a fraud. I didn't have aspirations to be a proper lawyer, unlike most of my peers, and was constantly surprised that I was managing to get decent marks without ever feeling I had, in your words, got it. It probably explains why I've devoted so much of my life to supporting better legal education. I suppose my epiphany was that it doesn't have to be like this. And what's more, I'm going to try and prove it. And the way I was taught 30 years ago was still pretty traditional. We all sat at the feet of our professors and waited to be enlightened. Rarely happened. And that made me wonder whether the phrase thinking like a lawyer can possibly be rather damaging and undermine our identity. So, why did I call this lecture Tripping Over Thresholds? Well, primarily because I wanted to include thresholds and a good friend of mine suggested I could call it Tripping Over Those Thresholds, which I thought sounded lovely. But also, after I decided on the title, I realised that it is a journey where you can trip up. That even if it is a long journey with steps up or steps down, it's not uniform and it isn't a simple, clear trajectory. This lecture has given me the opportunity to consider whether thinking like a lawyer is a threshold concept or whether it has constituent parts. I looked at whether or not the threshold concepts we looked at could inform threshold outcomes in developing the law subject benchmark statement, which we did try to do. And it made me remember that learning the law is hard. Do you remember how hard it was? If you do teach law, I wonder what you think about recasting your identity as someone who helps a learner over a threshold. Might not. Does it help you remember or appreciate the liminal nature of learning an uncertain discipline? The threshold outcome statement of the law subject benchmark is set at level six, bare pass. That's the job subject benchmark statement. And I am aware that a lot of students will pass that without having crossed a threshold concept. I did. But let me describe for you, just to finish off, the legal learner in my mind, and I think we all have pictures of those students who did, and you may be thinking of yourself. They don't simply recognise ambiguity and deal with uncertainty in law, for example, from the threshold statement, no. They seek out ambiguity. They look for the uncertainty. They pursue the argument that is yet to be had. They dissect the source of the information and assess its provenance. They perceive the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, and they recognize if they conflict. They seek a precedent to bind or distinguish. They adopt a convention when it serves their purpose, notwithstanding it may be a counterintuitive convention, with a nod to Ricketts. But they're willing to use it as the exception that proves the rule, if not. They appreciate the difference, if there is one, between what the law is and what it ought to be. And that's why ultimately I've come round to not hating, not loathing the phrase thinking like a lawyer, because that could be everything captured in that phrase.
you very much. I can't get on now. Um, thank you, Becky. Uh, we've got an opportunity for some questions now, and Nigel and myself will run around the room. Um, or epiphany sharing without questions would be fine. Hello. Yeah, just press the back button. And then it should work. We've got. This one works. This one works. There is an opportunity for some questions. So, do you have any questions Perhaps if you could say who you are. Yep. John, John Hodgson, Nottingham Law School. I suppose the epiphany came when I met up with one of my former university colleagues about two or three years in after we'd left and gone our separate ways. I had just secured custody of a small child for the father against the opposition of the mother in the 1970s, when this was quite difficult. He had just secured judgment for his client for 20 million US dollars in a dispute over something or other. And each of us was chuffed to naffy breaks with what we had done. Each of us recognized that we could not do what the other was doing because it would have totally freaked us out. And I think you can see thinking like a lawyer is not thinking like a lawyer, but thinking like one of very many lawyers. And I think in my father's house there are many mansions, in the inns of court there are many places to go. And so what you get out of law is what you put into it coupled with your own personality traits. So I don't think I had an epiphany in the road to Damascus light bulb turning on sense but I I did get to grips with why I was comfortable with being a lawyer because I could see that I was doing useful things for people and it was the law that I'd learned which enabled me to do that mm. it was knowing the rules know being able to apply those rules and persuade a court that it should do what it would not normally have done. And that is, I think, what thinking like a lawyer is. It's being able to use what you've got in your way and not necessarily in the way other people do it. Thank you. But I see people do that on The Apprentice in a business context. And I know the quality of law, that, that, and I know the quality of your teaching, your understanding of the law and the science of people. And I've got no question that you think like a lawyer. But I, don't, I think you've done yourself a disservice in the quality of people that you bring to, to legal problems. Because I do see business people learning the law, learning the rules, learning how to adapt those rules, and then arguing decisively. I'm not sure if it's captured. And it may not exist. It may be what real people hear doesn't exist, and we're not that bloody special. But I don't think so. Otherwise, because Sarah, as a non lawyer, wouldn't think of something special. I think it may take a lay person to look at a lawyer and say, that's thinking like a lawyer. So we do. We need to have friends who aren't lawyers. Yeah. For us, that's one. Yeah. <laughs> Please, so who was first? Okay, can you? Does that work? It's a, it's a long time since I've needed a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, a long, long time ago, where I placed this, this question. Um, fully, so I don't need it, Chris. Um, fully 30, 40 years ago, when I joined the Association of Law Teachers, a do, yeah, really, a debate was then current, and some of you here will remember it, 
as to whether we were an association of teachers who teach law or an association of law teachers. And it occurs to me to ask Becky, after a brilliant Christmas tree performance, <laughs> whether there's a difference between thinking like a lawyer and thinking like a law teacher. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, I was concerned about that when I thought I'm doing thinking like a law teacher, thinking like a law academic. So I went to find some friendly practitioners and tried this out. Now, they, they agreed everything that they do is what I said they do. And I cannot, and I'm not saying they were, I cannot hand on heart say there wasn't a sense of self flattery involved with some of that. But I think I may have asked it wrong in terms of, do you think critically? Do you think in this way? So then, um, separately, and the follow up questions. So, what would you have said if a friend came to you with this problem? My friend Sarah came to me with this problem. And quite honestly, some, what I saw was, and what questions they asked me back, was going back to the source information and dissecting confidently legal rules, including one of the questions I asked, when you got to statute book, and was, they were able to go across the statute book, referring to, to sections and subsections, cross-referring to, to, with confidence, to different acts of parliament, in a way, and it's not that they could read legislation, which let's face it, takes a, is a challenge, but they could do so thinking laterally across the different provisions and then the case law in order to formulate a particular legal answer or answers to particular legal problems. And there's something within that skill set that yes, you need to learn statutory interpretation, yes, you need to understand case law, but it's when it comes together and within the context of a confident command in that set of rules which are peculiar and bloody different to learn, that's when you start to see the thinking processes involved. So I don't think it is thinking like a law teacher, although it's rather a nice way to think. Um, it, it may be, but I still have a problem with a lawyer, and students say to me, are you a lawyer? Yes, I am. Will you sit around a barrister? Neither. Are you not a lawyer? Really? Do you want to have that argument? <laughs> <laughs> they never have. I don't know why, it's my face going. But it's all, I mean, you can go to, to, to Susskind and all the other things about what is a lawyer, something that I wanted to do and got scared of, so we didn't. But I think that may be the crux of the problem in, in the phrase itself. Thinking like, well, that's why I started with which one? Which lawyer? Or the years? Sorry, I'm half. Yes, I should. Thank you. Uh, uh, Carl Stitchin from City Law School, and thank you for, I mean, it was really a thought-provoking, fabulous talk. Um, and I think you touched on just now one of the points I, I wanted to make, which is maybe the best people to answer the question are, for example, for those of us who've been in relationships with people who aren't lawyers, what thinking like a lawyer is because they may well be able to tell us what it is, both the positive and the negative. Yes. For me, and the word that also comes to mind, which I think is something we do either implicitly or explicitly teach our students, is about being brave, to be courageous with law. Um, I, you know, and I think of a time when uh, I was in a ho um, my partner was in a hospital. Uh, he had a tube in his nose. It was painful. It was not put in correct, and no one was listening to him. And he was saying to me, "I can't bear this." And I'm thinking, I have to be brave. And that's my that, and that's all the skills and knowledge that suddenly come back, flooding back. I go up to the desk and say, he withdraws his consent. Yes. And someone says back there, is he a lawyer? Or about me? <laughs> um, and I thought, well, yeah, it is having that bravery yes. to do what you ha what is right with with what you've been given through through the law. I agree with you completely. I think the opportunity doesn't often arise in teaching to give students the opportunity to show their courage. It's one of the reasons I love mooting so much. Um, we did mooting as a core assessment in, in criminal law. 
and I had a group of 20 students in there where every week someone would do a formative moot linked to the seminar question. And I had absolutely delightful students. We were about six weeks in, and she was always well prepared, she always laughed at my jokes, so she was clearly highly intelligent. And it was her turn. And she felt like I did before this lecture, but she looked me. And I said, you okay? She said, I'm terrified. I said, okay. What? I said, pretend to be me. Really? Yeah. Just pretend to be me. And she stormed it. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. <laughs> well, I don't know how to do it. Um, and, she, and then I said to her, what you need to do with your courage is you need to put it on like a goat. And when you're going out there and you're, you're hitting us and you're using your law, you may need metaphorically to dress yourself in the law and go and fight the good fight. And she's a criminal law barrister. Now, she would probably be on. But let's not go down the legal aid and the funding and the all of that one. Um, but that's, I agree with you, I think it takes courage to use it because the power of law, the responsibility of law, the moral courage involved with the ethical considerations. Isn't it a complex picture? I remember being, I, I've never retweeted more often, I was in a really bad mood. And it was post letter, and everyone was giving me simple solutions to a really complex problem. And I said, broccoli is a single ingredient food. Legal education isn't bloody broccoli. <laughs> I've never been retweeted so often. Please don't start the broccoli for me. Two seeds. <laughs> and that's what made me start to realise the complexity in all of this and, and how difficult it is to teach law and how difficult it is to learn law. But yes, I agree. The bravery, the key part to it. So, you had a. Um, Kim Silver. Um, yes, I just think as well, we teach our students, actually we can only teach them a tiny proportion of what is out there. Um, I've been a law reporter in my time and seen it just flash across my desk coming every single day. There is a vast amount there. And of course they will specialise, but actually in their lifetimes, think, you know, what law is developed in your lifetimes and what will develop again in theirs that we can't predict yet so part of thinking like a lawyer and somebody said that to me when I was a second year undergraduate by the end of this year we'll have taught you to think like a lawyer and if you want to go and do another subject for a year feel free is actually and that was always proved right that ability to take another bit of law and look at it and do that analysis and actually work out what it's all about so couldn't agree with you more. I remember the hours I spent learning hearsay in evidence before the Criminal Justice Act 2003 <laughs> completely changed my life. And I remember not resenting, yeah, actually, resenting the amount of detail I was required to learn as an undergraduate. Not why I was an undergraduate, I was not a very good undergraduate. Not but if I had been, I might have. Um, but looking at the syllabus of some of the places I've taught and thinking, why? Why is it so crammed? I mean, we trying to spoke about it at Cardiff. I spoke about it when I did what, what's it queued for? Just stop. It's going to change anyway. But what I'd rather have is a student who will say, I will pick up, I've never done family law, and I can pick up a statute on family law and some case law on family law, and I, with confidence, can read it, I can absorb it, I can interpret it, I can dissect it, I can apply it to a particular circumstance, and I can go off really, really good students might do it with tax. I've never crossed that threshold. But you can do it, and that's what I'd rather have. Students who are open-minded to seek out the uncertainty, seek out the unknown, and feel competent to do so. Oh, yeah, red pen, but we teach too much law. I understand more of it all the time. And to me, that's just the thing. Yeah. 
Agla de Gilita, I want to thank you for raising the question and brought me back to my undergraduate degree back in Lithuania, where I did my degree. And that was the first, one of the first lectures. Then we were told that after four years of our degree, which is uh, four years normally, we will be thinking like lawyers. <laughs> so um, that was one thing. And the other thing uh, about role models. And looking now, reflecting on when I was doing my law degree and what I'm teaching my students now, um, I think there's much more choice. I don't know if it's a time issue or it's a country issue, legal system issue, but the variety of lawyers that they see here, it's much bigger. They see academic young lawyers, they see academic lawyers in, in sparkly clothes, you know, who go there completely different you know and then there's the other issue of being a, a female lawyer and again my impression was you know you have to be strict and you have to wear suits and that's how a female lawyer looks like um, but I think it's it's good that in our law schools we have different types of lawyers some of come from legal profession some from academic background some come from completely different country and that challenges again opens minds of students that there's no one type of lawyer and and that's that's the reality. Thank you, I agree with you. And, and the global, the understanding that the law can be different, the culture can be different, is something that I don't freak me out when I go when I find out they have different laws in France. I have to learn that as well. <laughs> Becky, an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Pat Layton. Um, I have a small suggestion following um, to speed up the road to Damascus or the epiphany which is that every single law teacher in this country should teach law to non-lawyers. Everything with, with Carl said, what you said about your friend Sarah, says we need to have the ability to stand outside ourselves, which means stand outside our understanding of the law. The, the, the part of teaching I've always enjoyed and done most of, I very rarely ever taught law students. I didn't actually quite like them very much, actually, but that's another story. Um, but what you have to do when, when you're teaching, my first nightmare was teaching a whole class of police officers and then trading standards officers. And what, of course, you have to do is to tell them why they're there. You, you have to tell them to teach effectively that they're not learning rules. They're learning what you're talking about, which is a particular process. And that process is of assistance to them, not just lawyers. Because in order to understand law, you have to get under its skin. And I think anticipate the problems, the barriers, you called it obstacles and things uh, that, that, that prevent people really understanding. But the role of law in problem solving, the role and law of creating societal rights, etc., etc. So it depends what kind of students you're talking about. But I do think if we all learnt to confront a group of people who are sceptical about what we're doing, I taught a class years ago of, of, of um, very radical um, health visitors. Or was that a contradiction in terms? I don't know. And they, ju they just stood and jeered. They stood up and said, what the hell are you here for? We don't want to hear about this bloody law. It's all about bourgeois people crushing the working classes. And boy, did I learn from that experience. Because you have to go in and explain why, what law is there for, what you can gain from it, and what, in essence, what you're saying, the ability to think like a lawyer. That's my suggestion. Thank you. My scariest class was trade union activists learning employment law in the 1990s. <laughs> Can I do a question? Um, a lot of what you were talking about, Becky, was, was about a journey. And I just wonder, and it may be too big a question, but I just want to sort of put it into the, in, into the mix, how on earth we manage to explore the consequences of a journey without looking at the journey itself. And I'm, I'm, I'm conscious here with, with, with Julie present, Joe, it's one, one of the issues that I think we do need to be thinking about very seriously. Because if we're trying to draw conclusions about the journey by looking at outcome measures alone, I think we're facing enormous difficulties. 
And I, you may have a, a, a view on that if, if there's time. There's a tension. It's a tension I felt keenly throughout the North Subject benchmark. I'm sure that Julie and the SRO is going to be exactly the same. That on the one hand, you need outcomes because they are an objective and measurable way to say competence or, or pass or threshold. Um, and whether you call it, have you met the assessment criteria? Have you produced the thing against which we grade you? Um, I remember Jane Ching and I were mentoring a colleague at Trent. Uh, she was mentoring, I was eavesdropping. Um, talking about outcomes, because to, to, have a, to get fellowship in higher education academy, you have to meet certain outcomes to get to the UK professional standards framework. And this became a huge discussion about how you evidence you meet, and the word evidence is what it is, um, how you evidence you, you meet outcomes, and why outcomes are, are damaging to education, because it's more about the journey. And I said, I, I don't see it as being either or. I think you need to think very, very carefully about the way you describe your outcome. And if the outcome captures that level of that journey to, and I do think that's why the level of it needs to be specified, then it doesn't mean you stop. It means you have a qualification of competence at that stage. It doesn't mean because we've got a UK standards, uh, a UK um, education qualification framework, but it means you will go from GCSE fail to doctor. But we've got that framework that does show the journey, it shows equivalence horizontally, and it shows the journey vertically. And I think if we get this right, people don't want to stop. That's clear, we don't want to stop learning. And I've just had a text from a friend, uh, an ex student um, who's a barrister who, who stays in touch, he's still very good, he was an easy and he regularly contacts me about what else he's learned. He still says that appearing in court is, is always far easier than appearing in front of me in the boot. <laughs> he's much more comfortable in the court of appeal than he is. But he's still going through that learning journey. And he still will f look for precedents across the common law world that he'll look with confidence and understanding. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but do I think they're easy? Goodness no. And do you need to think very, very carefully about an outcome that captures a process? Yes, you do. Otherwise, it is meaningless. Can I, can I just pick on that? I think it's a very helpful and interesting question. Sorry. Thank you. Judy Brandon from the SRA. Very helpful and interesting question. And I think Becky said, got it spot on, actually, that the important thing is to get the outcomes right. And from us as a, a, as a regulator, specifying the outcome and not necessarily specifying the journey doesn't mean to say that the journey is not important. On the contrary, what I would suggest is it, may, it, it, it recognizes that the journey is absolutely critical, but that every person will have a different journey. And actually trying to specify particular journeys and put everybody into the same little pots and, and get them going on the same lines doesn't do justice to your lovely picture that had a person go, you know, the journey going all the way over like that. And everybody will have their own different wiggly line, which is absolutely fine. And we need to recognise the richness of that. And we need, I think, perhaps to move away from thinking that everybody's got to be on the same sort of tram lines, you know, and, and, and being clear about what the end point is doesn't mean that you don't recognise the, the wonderful richness of the journey to people's different journeys to get to that end point. Can I finish? But I, I promised my dad I did, because my dad is very, very unfair on holiday in Antigua, and, and would otherwise have been here. Yeah, right. Um, he said, so your presentation is about thinking like a lawyer, and that you, at the end of you go to drink like a lawyer. And I said, I think I should. <laughs> Thank you to Professor Rebecca Huxley Bins. So now we're going to be formal, you see, um, for that typically awesome talk. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank City Law School for hosting us this evening and their fantastic uh, hospitality, particularly to Nigel for organising rooms and making tonight happen. Um, yes, again, um, it's uh, much appreciated. Um, it happens every year, but 
there's a tendency then to forget that actually the work does go into this. So thank you again, Nigel. Uh, and once again, thank you. To, I think she deserves another round of applause. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> There is some uh, wine, as you would expect at an ALT event, uh, upstairs, and some light refreshments for anyone who's not an ALT member uh, and, and doesn't understand the alcohol concept, uh, and some food and nibbles as well. So I hope you'll join us upstairs and continue the conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>